acceleration was constant, so we could write down the acceleration as a function of time because it's always 30, 32. Now, <clears throat> I did use positive 32. Which direction does gravity accelerate? Yeah. Down. So if I keep this as positive 32, it'll be accelerating upwards. So let's go ahead and correct that. So gravity is going to pull downwards. So I'm just going to put a minus sign in front, which changes this to minus 32 and minus 32t. So we want to make sure gravity is pulling down, or else we're going to drop the package and we'll go up. This kind of off topic, but well, I mean, it kind of relates to this. So an integral, is it the same thing as an antiderivative? It is? Yeah, basically. Basically. They keep saying that, basically. It is. <laughs> it's, we'll get there very soon. So here's our velocity. We do have a undetermined coefficient right here, the C1. So how do we figure out C1? What information can we use from the problem to figure out the value for C1? So another name for V of T velocity is the derivative of the height function, so H prime of T, that's the function we're looking at. I do know a certain value for, of the velocity. So what is that 12 feet per second? If you look in the original problem, the hot air balloon is ascending at a rate of 12 feet per second. So that means right when the package is dropped, it has the velocity f from the hot air balloon. So gravity will start pulling on it, we'll start accelerating it downward, but right at the moment that it's dropped, it's moving the exact same velocity as the balloon. So we know at time zero, the velocity will be that 12 feet per second before gravity changes the velocity. So down here, this is the velocity at time t, so velocity at time zero is 12. So we know V of 0 is 12. We wrote that down right up here, the velocity. I wrote it as h prime of 0, but h prime is just the velocity function. So I have velocity at 0 is 12. I also know the velocity in general, so I'm just going to plug in 0 for t. So V of 0 is negative 32 times 0 plus C1 equals 12. So C1 is 12. So that is our constant right there. So our h prime of t, filling that value in, negative 32 t plus 12. So when time is 0, we got 12 meters per second upwards. No, meters per second, feet per second. And then when t uh, increases, we're going to have more and more negative velocity, basically. So when t is 1, even just after one second, it'll be going downwards. It won't even take a full, full second for it to stop moving up and start going down. All right, so that is our velocity equation. And what we need is how long does it take to hit the ground? So we need to look for the height. Did we write down our final, what our final condition is? We didn't. All right, let's talk about answering this question now. How long does it take for the package to hit the ground? How do we know the package hits the ground? From our... So our equation, our velocity equation, if we look at it, this formula is going to keep going down, 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 down. So the velocity is only, or the velocity will equal zero. It looks like when t... Uh, it's something like uh, close to a half or a third. So that'll be right after we drop it. It'll be going upwards for a very short time, then it's going to fall. So there will be a point where the velocity is zero. That would give us the maximum height. But I don't want the maximum height. How do, how do we know a package hits the ground? 
height is zero. So it starts at 80 feet, and then it's going to fall. So when the height is zero is when it hits the ground. So right here, when the height is zero. So when h of t equals zero. So we need to figure out what is h of t, and then we'll set it equal to zero at the very end. So we're almost. Uh, we're almost down to the height function. We have the derivative of the height function written down. So all we have to do is take the derivative away, or anti-differentiate. So let's do guess and check. So take your best guess at the antiderivative. It's just polynomial antiderivatives. So you should be able to figure this out. And don't forget, you're going to get another constant at the end. So this next constant I'll write as plus a C2. What's the antiderivative negative 32t? Negative 16t squared. Yep, negative 16t squared, so we'll try that. And check with the derivative. So derivative of negative 16t squared is negative 32t. And derivative of 12t is 12. So that's our antiderivative because the derivative is what we started with. Why couldn't it be like t is negative 32 power? Or the square root of that? OK, so let's try, let's try something different. So t to the negative 32, or regular? So what's, what would be the derivative of this? So you got the right coefficient. Yeah, so almost good, except our, our exponent is very different. So you'd, be, you'd have a very different function. So I strongly recommend don't try to memorize the antiderivatives. Just use your intuition, take a guess, and check. Remember all the derivatives. Don't remember the antiderivatives. Just use your intuition. This one? Yes. So that was, that was our guess, or that was my guess. Oh. And now I'm going to check by taking a derivative. Eventually, you'll see 12 and realize the antiderivative is 12t, or 12x, if you're doing it, uh, if x is your variable. It just takes a little while. Think of it as uh, there's t to the 0 here. I can write t times t to the 0 because that's 1, and I'm just adding 1 to the power. Does that work better? Yeah. So it's an invisible t to the 0 power. And you add 1 to the power, and then divide by the new power. So it's t to the first divided by 1, except we never want to write first powers because it, it looks like a derivative, so I won't write it. How do I find constant number 2, C2? Do I know anything about the height at different times? What do I know? What height at what time? Maybe. It depends on what our goals are. Yeah. Sometimes factoring polynomials is good, sometimes not. Uh, but we know 80 feet at 0 seconds, so we're going to use that. All right, so plug in 0 for t, 80 for h of 0, and figure out what constant number 2 is and then solve the entire problem. So answer that question that was asked. What time does it hit the ground? And it's not 0, because at 0, it's 80 feet off the ground. So t is time. Yeah. So are we at 0 seconds or 80 seconds? Zero seconds. So I'll give you a minute to finish this. So figure out your constant, and then what time does it hit the ground?
<laughs> so I'm doing correct algebra in blue. However, does that factor in get me closer to solving for t? No. So it depends on what your goal is. Sometimes you want to factor out like this, sometimes not. So here we actually have a quadratic. So there's, you can make an infinite number of algebra moves and not get closer to the answer. Well, not answer. Not get closer to solving for t in this case. So what's a better algebra move to make? So do we have to do any more calculus in this problem? So this is algebra. This is a quadratic. So we can try to factor. And when we say factor, we mean factor the entire three terms together. And what's another option if you can't factor? Complete the square. Complete the square. What's another option? Quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. All right. Synthetic division. You c if you know your first factor, you can do synthetic division to get your second factor, yes. Uh, I would say definitely if it was degree three or four, you'd have to go rational zero theorem, find your zero, then divide by that new factor. But we don't, we don't have to go that far. There is something you can factor out right away, at least two. A four, it looks like. That's reasonable. And you might as well get a negative four out. I mean, ugly time value. If this one worked out better. Oh, this will work out. What is square root of 329? 17, must be 17. I mean, cause, just because that 9 is there. So, seven, ooh, what did I forget? What's that? Really? Oh no. What's the, what is 17 squared? Gotta end it. Which one? Ah, oh, that nine fooled me. It's supposed to work out nicer than this. 
Oh well. So we got plus or minus square root 3, 29 over 16, and we add 3 fourths. So divide everything by 2. All right, those are ugly values. Maybe I made an algebra mistake. It's very likely. Why are there two t values? What does a graph of this h of t function look like <coughs> at the top of the screen? What does a graph of the h function look like? Parabola. Happy or sad? Sad. Sad. What's the y-intercept? So I'll draw really quickly, sad parabola, y-intercept of 80. It doesn't go up nearly that much after zero, though. It's going to look a lot more like that right there. So we'll have two x-intercepts. Or I should say two. This is the t-axis for time. It'll have two t-intercepts. And that's the h-axis. So it's going to go up a tiny bit and then fall down. So I want the bigger of the two t values. The smaller one would be the value I get over there. So I want to use the big time value, so we're going to go with the plus right there. So that is our time when it hits the ground. It's right enough. Nobody said anything. It's going to be a lot of arrays. I mean, it's the same algebra steps. There would just be a different number somewhere. So y is the bigger one? What's that? So y is the bigger one? So <coughs> our, the package is dropped right here when t is 0. So the package, this doesn't really This over here is before the package was dropped and doesn't really represent the way the package traveled. If it was shot from the ground and gravity constantly pulled down on it the whole time, it would have this parabolic trajectory. So this would be uh, what you would use for projectile motion. But it wasn't shot out of, uh, it wasn't shot from the ground, so it didn't originate from height zero. It started at height 80. And uh, when t is 0. So there's t equals 0, and this is t equals that weird number. Let's just call it t1. So our model was only valid from 0 seconds till it hit the ground. Now, if we were next to the Grand Canyon, it would keep falling for a little while. But eventually, it would hit something and stop falling. So unless, you're, unless it falls off the edge of the Earth and keeps falling downwards, this wouldn't model it. So any, almost any time you make a model, it's not going to be valid for all t values. Well, then you get in the debate, what is, you know, does time really go to infinity? Um, that's a lot more uh, theoretical question. So then we just go tiny little intervals from 0 seconds to 2 or 3, whatever the number that's close to. This is only valid for a few seconds, this model. What's that? You can say plug and chug. That's fine. Um, but what do you? What we've already chugged. Like we've computed everything. Do you want to turn that into a decimal? That's a different story. But you're just going to turn that into a different uh, an approximation using a decimal. I see all the right work here. So if, if I made an algebra mis or an arithmetic mistake, that'd be one point off. Well, this is right. Huh? Well, we get lucky sometimes. Um, how would so like um, how would you plug it in? The, like where would you plug it in to make sure you're right? Um. Like 
So we can see if this is consistent with every single um, initial value that we had. So we have the height function right here. So it's not the, the answer to the actual question is what time does it hit? So I'm gonna leave that in the uh, black circle or a black rectangle there. Here is what I would consider the final like product or the final result that we got that we used to get that number. So if we wanna say, hey, is this function correct or not? What we can do is plug in all of our initial conditions. So we have the height 80 feet when time is zero. So we can plug in uh, when time is zero, I should get 80 out of that equation or out of that function, which is pretty, pretty obvious. I'll get 80 when I plug in zero. And then the other initial condition was the velocity was the initial velocity was 12 feet per second. So I can just go back through and check, does that h function have the properties that I listed right here? That's about all you can do to check. We don't have any other information. So if it satisfies all these initial conditions, it has the correct acceleration. So the acceleration should always be negative 32, no matter what t is. And uh, the initial velocity, h prime of zero, needs to be 12. So if it satisfies those three conditions right there, then I must have the right function. And so we know the height's correct. That's the, pretty easy to see. And if we take a derivative, uh, h prime, we get negative 32t plus 12. And so if I plug in 0, I'll get 12, which was my initial upwards velocity. And if I take another derivative, I'll get negative 32, which is my constant downwards acceleration. So that's, I think, the only way to really check this without knowing the answer and seeing if your answer matches. But you can go back through and see, does my final result, my final function, actually have the properties that my problem listed? So if it has all the properties, it must be the right function. Does that answer your question? So in algebra, you can just take your, usually just plug in your initial condition in one single time and then see does it work. But the problem is we had three different initial conditions. One was a, the second derivative, one was the first derivative, and one was the function itself. So I have to check each of those three. And so I have to take a derivative and see if my derivative condition works, to take a double derivative, see if the double derivative matches, and then see if my height matches. So does this you know, final result here correspond to what my problem started with? And now we're going to jump into chapter five. There are plenty of other practice problems you need to do for antiderivatives. And the only way to get better at them is just practice. So I'm going to put an antiderivative on your uh, midterm on Friday. Anti an antiderivative from, from this section. Uh, I won't do a word problem now. It'll be more like the other ones that we did. Oh. And because the antiderivative problems I have to give you need to be short, I might have multi parts like part A, part B, part C. There'll be something more like something more like these here. That section. I think they won't be super, super easy, so maybe more like the last two. Something more like that. I'll definitely be sure to put some trig antiderivative in there. So you need to know your six trig functions. And if you can't remember six trig functions, just remember sine and cosine, and hopefully you can do the quotient rule for the other three. That's how we got them originally. You'll spend about two or three minutes, and then you probably need to simplify it. But if you don't remember it and you have extra time, you can always figure those out. So we're going to jump up to 5, 3. Are we doing chapter 1 and 2 at all? Chapter 5? 
Yeah, right. eventually. Okay. So the definite integral is written with this symbol right here. I just call it the integral symbol. It looks sort of like a stretched out S. And there's going to be two numbers, one on the bottom, one on the top. And there's a function inside and a dx. Now, because we're doing things out of order, the right side of this won't make any sense. Actually, I can use delta xn the way we'll compute it. <clears throat> All right, so the right side shouldn't make any sense right now. But what I can write here instead is the area between, between the x-axis and the function y equals f of x for x in the interval a to b. So for us, the definite integral will be the area between the x-axis and the function y equals f of x. And this is, doesn't go from for the entire x-axis. It just goes from some number a to some other number b. So I draw a quick picture of what this looks like. If your function looks like this right here, <coughs> it'll be the amount of area that I shaded in right there. There is one word of caution. The first area will be counted as positive because it's above the x-axis, and the second area will be counted as negative because it's below the x-axis. So there'll be a little bit of cancellation if you integrate it like this. There is a way to count the negative as positive, uh, and we'll, we'll definitely do that. But you split it up in the middle where it's 0, and then you compute the other one. But we'll do that in the next section. For now, just be aware, if you're below the x-axis, it's going to count that area as negative, even though it looks positive. So think about if this is. Let's say this is the amount of money every day that, or the amount in your bank account. No. The amount each day that you spend or earn total. And if you earn more than you spend, you'll be gaining money in your account. And if you spend more than you earn, you will be losing money in your account. And so if you add up the area, that's the total amount, uh, the total amount of change. So not all functions are integrable. So what does the word integrable mean? Able to be integrated. So pretty much every word that ends in able, you can put that in the front, and that's what it means. So. Not all functions are able to be integrated. The non-integrable integrable functions are very erratic. And now, when I say very erratic, the ones I've seen are incredibly not continuous, meaning that they jump around so much there's not even an interval or not a significant interval where they're going to be continuous. Um, I don't even want to define one right now because they're really ugly. Uh, but basically, they're just a bunch of points that move around a lot. And they're not connected in a continuous matter or a continuous manner. 
So we are not going to look at non-integrable functions in this class. So our, our functions in Calc 1 will be integrable. Can't even spell the word. All right. In Calc 2, we'll look a little bit at non-integrable functions. And the next time you'll really look at them is a uh, real analysis class, so your junior or senior year of math major. So you won't really see these functions very much. So I'm going to write down the integral properties, the definite integral properties. So I'm going to be a little bit lazy because we need to write down this again and again for these properties. So the important parts are not really the x dx part. It's really the uh, integral f from a to b. So the way I'm going to write these is I'm going to leave out the of x dx part. It'll just make writing a lot easier. <coughs> so I'm not going to write the of x dx part. So this first property states that if you go from A to B and integrate, it's the same as going from B to A, but counting it all as negative. And if we think about what's happening here, go from A to B. So if your function looked like this before, it was all this positive area. If you go the opposite direction, it's going to be counted as negative area, basically. So it depends on which way you travel down the x-axis. So if you travel the wrong way, above the axis counts as negative. It's kind of like if you drive up the I-5, something will be on your left side. And if you drive down the I-5, it'll be on your right side. It's just like that. Your perspective changes as to what's above versus what's below. So that's the first property. Second property, this one is very intuitive. What happens if you want to know the area from A to A of f of x? How much area do you think we'll get if we start at A and end at A? Zero. So you'll have a width of zero, basically. So that integral will be zero. So what about a constant multiple? So if this was our function right here, y equals f of x, what would happen if I used 2 times f of x? How would the area change? So at any x value in here, our y value would be twice as high. What would happen to the area? It would double. Same thing if it was 3 times as high? triple. So whatever you multiply your function by, it'll change the area by that multiple as well. So that's the constant multiple rule for antiderivatives. Now if you have two functions added together, you can split this up and count their areas separately. So if you're wondering how do these work, just think of, remember derivative is the opposite of an antiderivative. So what is the derivative of f plus g? And I'll just use prime notation. 
f plus g derivative, what can I do without knowing anything about f and g? f prime plus g prime. So that means if you have two functions added together and you want to know their antiderivative, you can anti-differentiate each function separately. And that will be the antiderivative. So that, oh, I should have written that down below. That's correspond to the second one. And what about the constant times a function, the derivative of that? Almost. If I, t if I just had derivative of a constant, then it would be zero. What about constant times a function? Constant multiple rule. So I can bring the constant outside the derivative. So it's c times f prime, like that. So that's our constant multiple rule. You could bring constants outside your derivative. So those two rules correspond to antiderivative rules. And last one that we're going to write down, I'll write down some non-rules too. What in the world happened on the last one? So we're going a to b. We got some function right here. We can get the area, and then we just take some value c. So the left side represents that total area as one piece, and the right side, those two integrals, are get the area of one and the area of the other. Add them together, and you should have the same area. Oh, yeah, this is an important one you need to write down. It also turns out C does not have to be between A and B. So C doesn't need to be here. C can be over here. How in the world does that work? So I want to know what's the area from A to B. And if we look <coughs> over here, Obviously, the area from C to B is much bigger than the area of A to B, or at least a little bit bigger. What is this area right here from A to C? That means from A to C, but you're going the wrong way. So it's going to count all that as negative. So we'll cancel out counting it going across this way. So we'll end up canceling. So C does not need to be between A and B. C can be on either side, either smaller than A or bigger than B. So there is no anti-product rule. There sort of is, but it doesn't work the way you think. So, and there is no anti-product rule. So if you get an integral of f times g, you really don't know anything to do with it. There are special cases, uh, for example, there are special cases that do work, but they don't use the product rule. So here's two functions multiplied together. What is their antiderivative? Secant. Secant. Not because of the product rule, though because you knew the, well, one of you knew the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So this didn't come from some anti-product rule. It came from, ah, I know what the antiderivative is. It's this function. So <coughs> a really bad thing to do is write the antiderivative separately, multiply together. That's not going to work for those two. So if you do see a product, there is no anti-product rule. You have to do it some other way. So 
So if you know the function f is less than or equal to the function g for all x's in this interval, what could I say about the areas? How do you think their areas would compare? You can be brave. Yeah, if f is smaller than, has smaller y values everywhere, then when I add up that area, it better be less. So if we have a little function and a big function, their areas will have that same relationship. And this needs to work for all x's in the interval. You can't have, well, sometimes it's smaller, sometimes it's bigger, then you won't be able to make that conclusion. Depends on how much bigger, how much smaller. But if you know for every x value, that you have a little function, a big function, then you can say the area of the little function will be less than or equal to the area of the big function. So we're going to let minimum be the minimum y value on an interval a to b. And similarly, the max will be the maximum y value. Ooh, that should be max. And I don't think we want B minus A in we want that in parentheses. So why does this work? <clears throat> Basically, if you know your function from A to B, might look something like this, but you have some minimum. We can just use some geometry in here. I'm going to draw one rectangle. I'm going to call this the minimum area. So inside this area, what is the, uh, first of all, what's the measurements of this rectangle? The base is B minus A, and the height is the minimum F right here. So we got a width and a height. So what's the area? You multiply those two measurements together. Now how does this blue area compare to the actual area under the function? So if I shade in that function area, it's going to be all this stuff right here. So we can see the minimum area is less than the actual area right there. We can do the same thing with the max area. And let's go, oh wow. What? Oh, good day for us. The glitter pen. All right. So that's the max area right there. And that's definitely bigger than, what's so funny? You don't like glitter pens? I like it. Uh, at least I'm not the only one that likes it. Beautiful. All right, so that's the max area right there. And that's the right side area right there. So you got a minimum, maximum, that gives you an estimate. It's not exact, obviously, uh, unless the minimum, maximum are super close. And then it gives you a really good estimate. But generally, uh, it'll just give you a way to say, ah, oh, it's maybe greater than zero or something like that, or less than 4,000. So it gives you some way to make estimates. So we'll do a lot more examples tomorrow.